let's uh, start with a question. Not so many questions, uh, actually probably just about right. Uh, uh, and if you have any kind of follow-up questions or anything as we go along, please feel free to do so. Uh, just grab the microphone and uh, fire away. <laughs> so, so we'll see what happens as we go along. Uh, so uh, let's um, start from the beginning. And Venerable, please, uh, if you wish to add anything, uh, any time, you are welcome to add whatever you like to add. Yeah. So, good day, Ajahn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a very Australian thing to say. Uh, it's about to say in Australia, good day, good day, good day, Ajahn. <laughs> Pertaining to Majjhimanikai 128, cause and condition, Dutulla, is this the same as Majjhima 64, Sabbaso, uh, Sabbaso Kaya Dutulla Nang Patipasad? Patipasadhyaya, Viviceva, Kamehi, etc. Is this the same one? Oh, now you're asking hard questions. <laughs> Where are you? There you are. <laughs> okay. um, uh, the, uh, possibly, uh, quite possibly, because uh, the, uh, the one at Majjhima 64 is you overcome the five hindrances and also Kaya Dutulla. So it is the very last things that you overcome just before you enter samadhi, this is what the five hindrances really are. Sometimes people think the five hindrances uh, incorporate you know, all sorts of coarse hindrances, but that's not really the case. Uh, because when you look at the gradual training, the way the mind is developed gradually, you start off by sense restraint, uh, and that already gets rid of the coarser hindrances. Uh, then you have uh, mindfulness and clear comprehension, which also keeps the hindrances in check. And only when, towards the very end, just before you enter samadhi, do you abandon the five hindrances. The five hindrances usually is a reference to refined hindrances. Uh, and here, kaya dutulanang patipasadaya vivichavakame, whatever, this is a part of the form, if I remember correctly, it's, very, it's related to the formula for the five hindrances, yeah, just before you enter jhana. Yeah, the before Yajana. So it's part of that. And of course, Majjhima 128, the uh, Upaklesa Sutta, also is about the refined hindrances as you ref enter Jhana. So it is quite likely that they are related to each other, I would say. Uh, but I haven't, I uh, have never even considered this question before. I have to look at it carefully before I can give an, a more clear answer. But I think quite likely it's the case. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's good. Uh, it's good to have students that are, who are more awake than you are. So that's always uh, always helpful. Uh. <laughs> okay, dear Ajahn, what is your view on putting a pet down if it is in pain and the vet reckons there is no hope of recovery? Uh, this is an interesting question. It's a question that uh, com uh, comes up kind of at every now and again. Uh, and uh, Ajahn Brahm has a very nice reply to that question, which I think is, uh, uh, may sometimes work, may not always work, but it may sometimes work. Uh, Ajahn Brahm says you should ask your pet. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, sometimes we have a connection to our pets in, the, in a way that we can almost, we have a feeling for what the pet wants. Yeah? When you have had a pet for a long time, uh, you can kind of, you have a connection to it, just like you have a connection to a human being. Uh, and uh, so you have some feeling for what the pet actually desires. So you ask the pet, uh, and then you kind of uh, see what kind of response you get. Yeah? And uh, sometimes you can kind of feel whether it seems to be the right time or not. So um, uh, that is one way of doing it. Uh, yeah? And sometimes the pet may be ready to die, just like a human being. Is you had enough, you don't want to carry on any anymore because it's just too much pain, too much suffering. Just like human beings sometimes uh, uh, would like to have euthanasia. The same may be true for pets. Uh, but uh, if you cannot find an answer that way, uh, then sometimes it is very, very hard to, to say uh, what is the right thing to do in these situations. Usually beings like to live. Yeah? Usually even human beings, even when they get very old and sick, they prefer to be alive. That's kind of the nature of, of beings. And it's the same is probably also generally true for animals, but not always true. Huh? So you do your best to feel out what is the, uh, 
uh, what, what seems to be right at a particular time. And if you do decide that an animal, uh, you know, it is the right time for the animal to die, it is not going to be a very bad karma on your part. Uh, you are trying your best to do what is right for the animal, and as long as you are trying your very best, uh, the karma is not going to be very bad. Uh, you are not doing it because you are angry, you are not go doing it because you are greedy or whatever. Uh, you may be a little bit of delusion because you don't fully understand the animal, uh, but it's going to be a very, very small amount. So it's like grey karma. It's neither bad nor good, it's somewhere in between, because you're trying your best. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about these sort of things. It's not going to, it's not, doesn't going to kind of weigh very heavily on your balance sheet, nor on, on your karma balance sheet, nor is it going to be, you know, very bad or very good for the animal itself. So I think it is one of those things. As long as you are sensitive, careful, and do it with a sense of a good heart and wisdom, uh, you're not going to go very far wrong in these kind of areas. Uh. So, I hope that helps. Uh. Um, Next one. Do you, would you like to add anything, Venerable? Are you are you okay with that? Uh, yeah. Good enough. Okay. Good enough. Okay. Uh, dear Ajahn, one the question number one. This is always very tricky. You put get one piece of paper, but then you have three questions or whatever on one piece of paper. <laughs> it's very very smart, very very sneaky. So yeah. That's that's a good point. So you say it's actually that's the probably the reason to say papers you have ten questions there, another ten on the back. Yeah. <laughs> Dear Anjan, is one who is in deep samadhi experiencing an out of body experience? <laughs> uh, that is a is an interesting question. In a sense, it is. In, in a sense, you are in having an out of body experience in the sense that uh, the body is gone. So you actually know uh, what it is like to not have a body. This is the kind of experience you have in Samadhi. It's similar to the kind of experience you have if you are reborn in the very high Brahma Loka or something like that. Yeah? Body is gone, senses are gone. So in a sense, it is an out-of-body experience. But it is an out-of-body experience of a particular kind. Yeah, there are other out-of-body experiences. The more normal kind of out-of-body experience is not like this. This is a very profound out-of-body experience. The more normal ones are not as profound as this. A normal out-of-body experience is like when you are on the operating table, you are dying, and you come out of your body. That kind of out-of-body experience is not fully an out-of-body experience, because you still have a body. Yeah, out-of-body experience like that, you ha have a body, but it's of a more fine material. You still see yourself pretty much as you did before, but it's a different kind, a slightly different kind of body. You haven't fully left behind the five senses and the body yet. So it's a very good, it's actually a very good question. Thank you for that one. I, I like that one. So, but, so there are different levels in a sense of leaving the body behind. When you get to deep samadhi jhana, you leave the body behind in a much more fundamental and absolute sense than the normal outer body experiences. Where you still have a physical body. It's explained in the suttas. It's explained as a, if you have a, like a snake or a straw. If you have a straw, you can pull another straw from out, from inside of it. Yeah, and it's like the sheath on the outside comes off, and the inner straw looks very much like the outer one. Huh? It's very similar. Huh? Yeah, or or a snake. The snake, the snake, the uh, the skin, outer skin comes off, and the inner snake is pretty much the same as the other one. Huh? In the same way, when you pull the m your mind out of this body, uh, you get another body, which looks pretty, sh pretty much similar. Uh, this is the ordinary out-of-body experience. Uh, but in, when you, uh, in samadhi, it's a much more profound thing. Uh. If yes, what is it that is out of the body? Well, it is only out of the body in the sense that the body, you don't experience the body anymore. It's so it's the mind that is out of the body. Yeah, It is the mind is a... Uh, is um, uh, you, you have a pure experience of mind because you have uh, distilled it from the body. It is taken out of the body. All the five senses the, and the physical body are gone. This is the first time you have a pure mental experience. So now you know what the mind is. Uh, like an experiment, when you want to find out what something is, you have to separate it out from other things. And when you see it by itself alone, then you know what that thing is. And this is what you're happening when you do uh, when you have this kind of samadhi experience. Uh. So it's the mind. Is that called uh, Niroda Samapati? No, that is not Niroda, because Niroda, also the mind, is also gone there. 
Yeah, so Niroda Samapati is uh, in the sutta it's called Sanya Vedaita Niroda in the sutta. Uh, it's called Niroda Samapati in the commentaries. Uh, uh, but that is when everything is gone. Everything is what? Ev everything is gone. There's nothing left. The mind is gone too. Uh, here the mind is still there. In Samadhi you still have a mind. You still feel, you still experience, you're still conscious. In, in Niroda Samapati, everything is gone. Blank. Nothing. That's the difference. Yeah, there's uh, some story that, uh, you know, some monk, he will tell people yeah. that he will be going for like seven days yeah. doing Niroda yeah. Samapati. Yeah. And his body is just there. And he told people not to touch or not to do <laughs> anything with, with the body. And he just gone, you know, for seven days mm. and then back. It's just yeah, yeah, it's the, the true the story. Isn't it's it? from the suttas. Sir. The no, it's the real, there is a real story. case. But yeah, true. But there is also in the suttas. So the real cases in the suttas, they should match up. If they don't match up, you have a problem. So that matches up. You know the story in the sutta? Which one? The story in the sutta is a story. Uh, it's in the um, Marva Tajaniya Sutta, Majjhimanika 50. Uh, it's a story of uh, Mahamogalona in a past life. He was Mara in a past life. You know that story? Yeah. Yeah. There's a story in there about one of the disciples of the past Buddha. And uh, this disciple, he was a uh, very good meditator. He could enter Niroda's Mapati. Uh, yeah, Sanya Vedaita Niroda is called in the Sutta. So. so he was sitting in the forest. Uh, and he was sitting there, but when you go into Niroda, you become so still. Everything is gone. There's no breath. There's nothing. You're absolutely still. It looks like you're dead. It looks like you're dead. Yeah, no, absolutely still. So these two uh, men come by who are they collecting firewood, firewood collectors. Uh, yeah, and they see this monk in the forest. They're collecting fire. They've got this big bunch of firewood. Uh, they think this monk is dead. Yeah, we better make a big pile and fire and burn him up and cremate him because he's dead. Uh -huh. So they make this big pile of wood. They put the monk on top. Uh, they light the fire, uh, and then when they see the fire is going well, they, they leave. Uh, the next morning. What happens? They go into the village. In the morning, they give alms to the monks. Yeah, so kind of all the monks come in, and so they give alms to the monks. Uh, and suddenly, they give alms to this monk, and they wonder, "Who is this?" And they look up. That is the monk they were burning yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> because the story is, is that if you go into Niroda Samapati, Sanavadai to Niroda, you cannot do anything with the body. The body is preserved regardless of what you do. So even if you try to burn it, nothing happens. Uh, according to the story, nothing can happen to the robes. So when you wake, come out, when the fire is gone, and you come out near Rolas Mapati, oops, you just kind of brush off the ashes of your robe, and then you walk back into the village, and you continue. That's the story. Is it true? I don't know, but well it's, it's, it's interesting. Tried it? yeah. <laughs> I tried it. Um, but so, this, so this is supposedly possible to do, yeah, seven days, go into near Rolas Mapati. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so this happens. But this kind of, uh, this sort of, <laughs> this kind of attainment, this kind of samadhi attainment, uh, um, is so profound that everything stops. Your mind stops. Yeah, your mind is gone. Uh. So how do you know that it happened if your mind is gone? Uh? Oh. How do you know? How, how do you know? How do you know that you uh, attained a, an experience of complete cessation if your mind is gone? How can you know it happened? What do you think? Yeah? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, so this is kind of this is a little bit beyond this question, but anyway, it's uh, well. So the way you know, yeah, the way you know is that uh, as you enter the attainment, uh, everything becomes more and more peaceful, more and more quiet, uh, until eventually you, ha you you reach the boundary of what is possible to be conscious of, uh, and then blank, nothing here. Yeah. So y you can see the movement towards complete cessation. Uh, and then on the other side, when you come out of this, the very first thought, the very first uh, consciousness you have uh, is the most refined consciousness possible. Uh, and then gradually you come out of it. Uh, so you know it by inference. You cannot know it directly because you're not there. There's nothing there. But you know it by inference. You can see the movement of the mind moving towards cessation. Uh, then it ceases uh, and then it comes out on the other side. Uh. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, you know, interesting. Interesting. Mm. Very interesting, yeah. So it's, I think it's possible. But that's, that's Niroda. Yeah, that I heard yeah, yeah. many mm. caves, you know, some monks, they did that. Mm -hmm. 
and then no, if anybody touch the body, then he'll be dead. That's not what it says in the sutta. But it is the real case. <laughs> it is. If anybody touch it before he comes back, uh -huh. the monks come back, then he will be dead. Uh -huh. So then, you know, okay. everything, his, his room will be closed. How do you know it will be dead? How do you know? Her? Did you try? <laughs> 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 well, that, that is a story also. Yeah. Uh, that uh, if somebody, you know, didn't listen. To what, <laughs> you know, so he, they touched the body and yeah, okay. just died. Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, interesting. Okay, well, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next question here. <laughs> okay, dear Ajahn, is uh, practicing compassion a purely mental? Uh, thought, uh, or has it to be followed by action, compassion and action, like what was being done by Su Chi Foundation here? Um, with many of these things on the Buddhist path, it is actually more important to do it in practice than do it just in mind, uh, yeah, because the uh, uh, practice is actually where you learn it. That's when it becomes uh, where you kind of lay in the basic foundations for these things. Uh, it's like doing metta meditation. All you do is metta. May all beings be well, may all beings be happy. And sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes you, <coughs> you start, you, f you nod off or something. It does, sometimes it doesn't really work. Yeah? We try these things, it doesn't have a power. So metta practice should always start off with uh, uh, doing these things in action. Yeah? Metta in speech, metta in body. Uh, that's how the Buddha explained these things. Uh, and then metta in thought. Uh, just, uh, you know, actually wishing other people well, just, in, just not even doing meditation, but just wishing people well in daily life, thinking kind thoughts of other people, not thinking harsh thoughts and all of these things. Uh. So that is where metta should start. Uh. And if you start with that, then when eventually you come to your meditation cushion, you sit down and you do your meditation, then it works, yeah, because you have laid, in, laid down the foundation for all of these things. Uh. So very important to lay down the foundation. And it's exactly the same thing with compassion as well. Uh, same idea, we start off with compassion in daily life. Uh, and uh, there's lots of opportunities with that. Uh, compassion and metta, there's an enormous number of opportunities to do uh, little acts of kindness in life. Uh, and as long as you take those opportunities uh, whenever you can, uh, then you are doing the right thing. Uh. So please do that. And people often, uh, uh, this is, uh, so useful for many reasons, because it leads you to being able to do these things in meditation, but also because you're building up your general levels of kindness, you're making good karma, you're making yourself feel better, and you're doing things that you know will work. These things are actually possible to do, whereas these other things are, more, uh, are much more um, uh, subtle and uh, difficult. And one of the things that always, uh, you know, fi I found so interesting when I asked some of the greatest meditation teachers around, uh, and I met some very remarkable meditation teachers over the years, uh, and you asked them, you know, what, how to practice metta, uh, and uh, they will often give you a very simple answer. Uh, these are the people who might be arahants, uh, yeah, in the world, uh, who might be fully awakened or whatever, uh, and they say, well, if you want to practice metta, just uh, ask yourself when you wake up in the morning, uh, what can I do for the world today? Uh, how can I add something to the world rather than subtract something? Yeah. Yeah, so metta is about how we act moment to moment, the ability to act with kindness in general. That's what it is about. And compassion is the same way. Yeah. So when you see suffering, yeah, you want to alleviate the suffering and help other people. Yeah. No? Okay, you're happy? Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Dear Ajahn, why are some monastics allowed to eat food like cheese, uh, seaweed and dark chocolate? Uh, why are some of them allowed to do this? Because they have a special allowance. Is that <laughs> 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 No, no the, the reason is, you will always, f this is kind of strange about the monastic rules, is that you will never find two monastics who practice the rules in exactly the same way. Uh, and the reason for that is because there is uh, it's a matter of interpretation, yeah? The rules aren't 100% uh, kind of finalized, it's not possible to know exactly what they mean. So there will be minor uh, uh, 
minor differences in how people practice. Uh, and that's okay, it doesn't matter. As long as there are small things, it's not so important. Uh, what really matters is that the monastics keep the big rules, the rules that really are important. That is what matters, and that one should really be concerned about. Uh. So the reason why some people uh, eat cheese in the afternoon is because that was a standard in the Thai forest tradition. Uh, the Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Man, who was kind of one of the forefathers of that tradition, he uh, thought cheese was equivalent to a Pali word called Navanitang. Navanitang is one of the five allowable requisites in the afternoon for monastics. Uh, and so he thought Navanitang is cheese. Uh, he didn't know what cheese was. He was, he was from Thailand. The cheese is a Western food. Yeah? It doesn't really exist in Asia. So he had never seen it before. So, oh yeah, this looks like Navanitang. So, okay, let's call it Navanitang. But he didn't really know. Yeah? It's not a Thai food. The cheese is not, doesn't really exist in Thailand. Now it does, because now everything is so international, but not in those days. Uh, so whether cheese is Navanitang or not is very questionable. Yeah? And many people will say no. Some people say yes. Uh, and uh, other people say, and for lay people, don't worry too much about it. Yeah, it's not a big deal whether some people have a bit of cheese in the afternoon. Uh, in our monastery in Perth, we don't actually have cheese in the afternoon, uh, but uh, Ajahn Brahm, some, sometimes when you go outside the monastery, you do. And if you're offered cheese, you may have uh, cheese in the afternoon outside the monastery. We don't have any very kind of clear final decision on whether it's allowable. Ajahn Brahm reckons it's allowable, uh, uh, but. Uh, but there, there are good grounds either way. Seaweed, uh, I don't know about seaweed, never heard of any monks who have seaweed in the afternoon. Uh, never heard about that, not sure about that one, don't know about that one. Dark chocolate, well the dark chocolate is because it is a combination of allowable uh, items or allowable ingredients. So um, you have like five ingredients that are called the five tonics, uh, yeah? Besadja in Pali, uh, and these five tonics are uh, sugar, Honey, uh, ghee, uh, ghee is like uh, is something made out of uh, m milk or, or whatever, yeah? And then you have Navanitang, I just mentioned before, and then you have oil. Uh. So chocolate is like oil, uh. it is sugar, uh. and then you have cocoa, and cocoa is a lifetime medicine in, uh, in Pali. It's like a, a coffee and tea and cocoa, they are like called lifetime medicines. You can have them anytime you want. Uh. So this is uh, kind of the technicalities of the monastic code, the monastic vinaya. So uh, it's just matters of interpretation, yeah? And that's why never expect two monastics to practice exactly the same way. Huh? Uh, and uh, then you won't have so many, and, and it's just, you know, uh, there's no need really to, to um, for all monastics to practice the same. It's actually impossible, it's never gonna happen, huh? because there isn't any final word on these things. Huh? Also, Venerable Ratapala's way of getting his parents' permission to ordain is almost the same as Venerable Sudina. It is actually the same, uh, yeah? as described in the first Vinaya rule. Are they the same person, or is it simply a coincidence? Thank you. Uh, indeed, that is um, a good question, and um, I think many people will say that they are, in fact, the same person. It's the same story that has been used in two different places, uh, and one of those is more likely to be original than the other one. Uh, and I think it is, I think most scholars take the Ratapala Sutta to be the more original one and consider the Sudinna story in the first Parajika Vinaya rule to be a later adaption of that one. So to have a, st a background story for Parajika one. Uh, but it is uncertain, so it is very likely to be the same story because it is basically word for word the same all the way. Uh, it did exactly the same thing uh, and uh, it's kind of a unique story in that way. So that's a good observation, and uh, this is often what you find in these, uh, uh, in the suttas, in the vinya, you find stories kind of being used again like that. Okay, dear Ajahn, in meditation, when joy arises, do we observe it as a feeling, or can we enjoy it by riding on the feeling here? Um, when joy arises, uh, uh, Basically, you uh, don't. What you do, ideally, depending on how deep, deep that joy is, uh, you continue with the breath. Uh, the breath should be the anchor of your meditation practice. Uh, yeah. So stay with the breath. The breath is there. The joy is there. Uh, and then you, if you watch the breath in the right way, uh, and it keeps on calming down, the joy gradually becomes more powerful. Uh, and really, it's. Um, 
It's hard to say. Sometimes you can also go with a feeling. It's also possible. For example, you do metta practice. You may not even do um, mindfulness of breathing at all. So it's also possible to do these things via just purely by feeling. Yeah. But normally at this stage, the breath is still prominent enough. You can keep going with the breath. So you have the joy, you have the breath. Uh, and then you allow everything to calm down. And it's really only when you come to the a nimitta stage, when you see bright lights or whatever, uh, that is where the breath tends to fade away uh, much more and it goes more into the background. And then you kind of change your object to the nimitta, yeah, and you don't actually worry so much about the breath anymore, even though it may still be there very faintly in the background somewhere. Yeah. So, um, but tr you know, that this doesn't mean you don't enjoy the, enjoy the joy, please enjoy the joy, yeah. yeah? <laughs> Enjo enjoy is enough, enough with one word there almost. Uh, so just enjoy her, because that is a very important part of the meditation practice, to enjoy this. Uh, uh, so, uh, but without getting too attached, right? Uh, otherwise, <laughs> you have a problem in the future. Uh. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So let's uh, get on to the next one now. Dear Ajahn, can you please clarify for us about the Dhamma being shortened by 500 years because the Buddha started the nuns order. Oh, that was, uh, yeah. And Venerable Ananda plea to him three times before he agreed to do it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, P.S. There are still participants here who <laughs> have this. Okay. So, uh, um, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, and w what actually is going on there about the uh, when when this happens and the, uh, the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda that yes he will agree to start the nuns order uh, because Venerable Ananda says well nuns have the same ability to attain awakening stage and all of these kind of things as uh, monks have so because of that there's a good reason to have nuns uh, yeah why shouldn't the nuns be given that opportunity and of course it's good to have women being given the same opportunity as men and uh, as I mentioned before, some people regard the Buddha as the first feminist uh, yeah, because he allowed women a roughly equal status as men in the Sangha. And that's kind of nice. Uh, I think that's a very, a very nice thing. Yeah. But um, this whole thing about the, um, uh, the whole sasana or the Buddha's teaching being reduced in lifetime because of the ordination of women, there's been a lot of scholarly research on that and there is a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty as to whether this really is historically correct or not. Uh, and uh, I, when you read the whole story, uh, it does, to me, it does seem a little bit strange. The Buddha says, okay, we will now ordain women. And the next thing he says, okay, but now the sasana will only last for 500 years. Uh, so what is it doing? Is it, is it really supportive of women or is it not? You start to wonder, you know, why is it kind of undermining, apparently, the women's order pretty much straight away after he has, uh, uh, he, he, he has um, agreed to ordain them. Uh, and uh, in, in one way, I, to me, the story does not seem very, very plausible. Uh, I, I, to me, it just sounds a little bit strange. And I think a lot of people who do comparative studies of this particular uh, sutta and this particular passage with other suttas have come to the conclusion that uh, quite possibly it was not written by, by the Buddha, but it may have been something that was included in this at a later stage. Uh, and this is always a possibility. Remember, these are narratives. Uh, this is not the word of the so, well, this actually happens to be in the spoke in the word of the Buddha, but it has a kind of narrative context to it. Uh, and uh, but one of the things that it does say, which is interesting, yeah, uh, it, let's say the Buddha did say that now it's gon only going to last for 500 years. Uh, he still allowed women to ordain. That is kind of the astonishing thing. If it really thought it was going to be detrimental to Buddhism, and he still allowed women to become nuns, uh, he must have thought it was incredibly important. Uh, so you can turn that whole thing on its head uh, and say, actually, uh, ordaining women was so important uh, that even if it kind of reduced the life of the sasana, still it needed to be done. Uh, that's another way of looking at it. Uh, but I think it is unlikely to be the case. I think it is more likely that the Buddha didn't do that. He wouldn't want to harm his sasana. He would have tried to find a way to do this so that it was possible without harming the sangha and the future of Buddhism. Uh, so I, I personally doubt whether it is true. There's no way of knowing absolutely for sure with these things. Uh, uh, all you can do is uh, come to approximate uh, understandings. Uh, 
And the Venerable Ananda pleaded to him three times before he agreed to do it. Uh, uh, that's true, he was kind of, uh, he, he seemed to have been uh, reluctant and it seemed to have taken a while before he, uh, before it actually happened. Uh, it is hard to know exactly what was going on there. One of the interesting things that has been pointed out by Venerable Analayo, who is one of the great scholars of these things, uh, uh, he has said that when you read the various versions of this story, uh, versions in Chinese translation especially, uh, they often have a different sequence to these things, different things happening. Uh, so for example, one of the things that happened uh, in, in that version, in the Chinese version, uh, was that um, initially uh, the Buddha said, I think he said that uh, to, for the women, for Mahapajapati Gautami, who was his foster mother, to actually practice at home rather than become monastics first of all. Uh, so he started off practicing at home because it was considered too dangerous for women to live an ordinary ascetic life. You can imagine just living in the forest by yourself can be pretty, can be, can be pretty daunting, uh, especially in ancient India if you're a woman, uh, it can be quite dangerous. Uh, so it, he, he said basically there it was a matter of protection. Yeah? So you have to wait until the situation is right in the Sangha so we can make sure that the order of bhikkhunis is properly looked after before we start ordaining them. You can't ordain someone when there is no support, when there is no kutis for them. There, there, there's lacking the kind of the, the standards that are required to make it viable. Uh, and that seems to be coming out of one of the Chinese versions of this particular story, or, or a couple of them. So you can see how the, it, it depends on which origin story you read. The, the exact historical sequence of things basically is uncertain and, and too unreliable to draw any conclusions. What we do know, we do know that the Buddha did ordain women, uh, so it must have been an important thing to do. Uh, yeah, that's what we do know. The rest of the story, uh, uh, I think, is... Uh, is um, is much more uncertain and more unreliable. Huh? Anyway, yes, no, maybe. Huh? What do you think? Yeah, any venerable, you are, you are, you should, an you should answer this question, not me. Huh? <laughs> well, just like what you said, many. Uh, 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 scholar, you know, have different opinions, and but more likely we, the Pikuni, we uh, kind of think that uh, many things that uh, said about the Pikuni is added later Absolutely. on. Yeah, mm. yeah, not not the the Buddha, you know, in, intended. Probably, you know, those senior monks that didn't like the Pikuni. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then the one that who pass on, you know, the teaching <laughs> from generation to generation, so they can put in, you know, the words that uh, they wanted to. So that, but uh, what is said has been uh, another. I had to ask three times, right? And then the Buddha uh, agree because uh, in. Uh, Indian society, even nowadays, the woman, uh, uh, most women in uh, you know in the village, in the small village, not in the city, the women stay home, and uh, the men go out to work. Still, in a uh, in a Buddhist city like uh, you know Bodhgaya and uh, Savatthi and things like that. Mm. I walk around in, in, the, in the village, the women stay home still and the men go to work and uh, if, if you think about 200, hey, 2000 and you know some years, those women <laughs> be out of the picture, you know, right? Because the culture, the restraint, the Buddha, that's why the Buddha hesitate to ordain women. Once the woman ordain and then they will leave, they will stay separately from home. It will be more, you know, dangerous, right? If you live alone and, and uh, apart from the, the family, from the men and, uh, you know, for protection, things like that. I think the, the main reason why the Buddha, you know, 
hesitate to ordain women is for for the safety of the after we after women ordain <laughs> will be difficult life. Even uh, even <laughs> even nowadays, you know, the Pikuni still live not as the uh, as well as the the pickles. <laughs> 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 yeah, but people still because of you know the pickles order rooted for how, how many thousand years already. But the pickuni we just started uh, less than twenty years. So we need you know to do a lot of work to build up you know the. Uh, to for the people to have the confidence in us, have faith in us, and then you know, then later then they will support us. But eventually, you know, eventually the the Pikunis and the Piku will be just about you know left hand and right hand in the in the future. But eventually, it, it will take time. But <laughs> you know. It, but it will grow, and if you guys <laughs> support us, then <laughs> you know, it will be growing fa faster. But uh, here in Malaysia, Pikuni very few, only two or three, right? In Thailand now we have about some in Pikuni about two hundred, and uh, it's growing. You know, maybe a woman. Or then uh, get come to ordain more and more. But I in Sri Lanka, they have a lot. They ordain every year and uh, several thousands, several yeah. thousands in Sri Lanka. Yeah, many yeah. thousand. But in the uh, Sri Lankan tradition, the woman uh, there were uh, ten precepts before. They, uh, they call that's a that's a silamata. That's a silamata. I mean, mm, mm. yeah. There are ten precepts. They are wearing uh, the robe, but uh, with no no ganda. Just one big piece of cloth, <laughs> but no 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 ganda like <laughs> the monk or pikuni. But the color is more like yellow, not white like Thai Meshi. The eight precepts they wear white, but in Sri Lanka they wear yellow. Yellow or some some brown, so it, you know, in the distance, it will be just like what the monk would would wear, or some some orange color. So it's much, not much different. But in Thailand, uh, those eight precepts only wear white, right? But so when we, when the, they see the woman wearing this color, they will look. <laughs> yeah, at 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 first. Because I've been out there many years now. At, at first, when uh, we travel around, uh, people will people will just stare at us, and uh, they will look. You know, you a woman, you a man, and why are you wearing this robe? That, that kind of thing. But now, now people are more familiar with us. They know, you know, who we are, and uh, so we don't have much uh, trouble. In, but in certain area like in the northeast, mm. where Chan Chai is <laughs> around that area, mm. some uh, can the uh, some some there there's a pikuni in Konkan. Mm. It is the northeast area, and the uh, the chief uh, the, of the village he came with the uh, villagers mm. to to chase the uh, you know away. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. After after yeah. the katina, just uh -huh. we passed katina, uh -huh. I went. Uh -huh. After we all finished, it's the uh, the katina from the loyal family. Yeah. And after all the katina finished, and then we all went back, and she she said that the the head of the village, with the villager, came, and <laughs> tried to you know chase her away. <laughs> but uh, she called the police. Uh -huh. So but she she called the police and the uh, police came and she told the story. You know, the land is uh, given to her by uh, you know village. Okay. Yeah. 
and uh, and uh, she told the story to the the police, and the police that mean you know mediate. Then, then they all went back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. It's good that she takes proper action. You know, that's good. Okay. Yeah. In, in some part, yeah. it's still yeah. Yeah. the people are still you know again mm. some part of the country, mm. like in the south. In the south, in certain, certain province, mm -hmm. even the the natives, they are, they are mm -hmm. there. The Pikuni, she didn't learn the country Tamarad, and she grew up there, and she was trying to set up her center, and she got mm -hmm. kicked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so she has to move to another city. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Hardship, hardships of being a Pikuni, yeah, not easy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, you know, I think uh, one of the things about ancient ancient Indian society was not very friendly towards women. So right. a lot of the reason why these rules came into the vinaya is because simply because of the pressures from society. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily that the monks were super duper anti bikini or whatever. It's just that it was a general society feeling, and for that reason, uh, a lot of these rules were added. And we know that because uh, the rules for the bikinis they vary so enormously between the different traditions. Uh, it's fairly clear that many of them came a long time after the after the Buddha. So that I that is perfectly uh, I agree perfectly with that. Uh. Okay, good. So let's uh, move on to the next one. There's only a couple of questions left. Um, dear Ajahn, I am very inspired by forest monks who are able to meditate in such scary conditions. Uh, May I know how to overcome those fears? <laughs> um, the way to overcome these fears uh, is to have deep meditation practice. Yeah? The deeper your meditation is, uh, uh, the less fear you're going to have. Uh, because, uh, and the reason is because you identify more and more with the mind. You're not so concerned about the physical body anymore. Uh, when you go into a jhana state, because you give up the body completely, uh, you don't really care about the body anymore. The body is irrelevant. You identify fully with the mind. And if you die, die, okay, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Yeah, death is, not, death is no problem. When you die, you probably go to a really nice rebirth afterwards anyway. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. So this is kind of the, uh, this, is, this is how you, you do that. You're not worried because you already, your meditation is already deep. And there isn't really much point in going to the forest or going to a scary place unless your meditation already is deep. That is a place you go to deepen your meditation further. There's an interesting story in the suttas where Venerable Upali goes to the Buddha and he says, the Buddha, I would like to go into the forest to meditate by myself. Can you, excuse me, please give me a teaching? And Venerable, and the Buddha says to him that you should wait till you can see the four jhanas in yourself. Only when you see the four jhanas in yourself should you go into solitude and practice by yourself. So in other words, you stay in a place that is fairly safe, like a monastery, uh, uh, like maybe the BGF, maybe, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> this is quite nice and safe, isn't it? So you stay here and then you learn how to kind of get your meditation together. And then when you really are having meditation together, that is when you go and really stay in the forest by yourself. Uh, like some of those forest monks in Sri Lanka or Thailand or wh wherever it is that, that are very inspiring. It is precisely because they have deep meditation that they are able to do that. Uh, then you have no fear. Uh, but you can't, you can't really expect to let go of your fear fully until you uh, get deep meditation, because that is when you let go of the body, you identify with the mind, and then you, uh, it doesn't matter so much anymore. Yeah. But uh, generally speaking, if you have a happy mind, uh, if you have a good mind state, uh, and you feel good about yourself, uh, then death does not seem so scary. Uh, yeah, because you kind of know that the future is safe. Yeah, if you feel good inside, you know that the future is going to be looked, looked after when you die anyway. Uh, nothing so much to worry about. Uh, but if you have a mind that is not so good, not so uh, bright and light and all of these things, uh, then of course the future is more uncertain. It depends on uh, all kind of factors, what happens afterwards. Uh, and that is why it is more scary at that particular stage. Uh. Okay, so... Oi. One blank question there. <coughs> uh, okay. Good. So this is the um, metaphor uh, uh, ping 
โอเค So okay, I hope that is close enough, and then we can uh, uh <coughs> do some chanting for the per person who is uh, in hospital with stroke. No problems. Is there any further questions, or uh, before we uh, call it a day? Any f more questions or comments by anyone? Yes. Sir. Uh, you said, <laughs> I forgot the state, and then you use inference, because ah yeah uh, yeah that one. Then when you said you use inference, it's after you come out of it, is it? Mm. When you're in it, you know it. D you don't know anything because everything is gone. Then it's like yeah. what death? Oh uh, no, the death! You are still there. Yeah, that's the difference. Is it? Death is not gone. This is like you really are absolutely gone. Consciousness, the mind stops. The mind stops, and then it stopped for a few hours or, or seven days, and then it starts again. Huh? God. Okay. So, I don't get it. So, <laughs> there, yeah. God, there's things there, well, but this one has nothing. Nothing, yeah. Nothing. Not, not only nothing, not, not even nothing. Yeah? Nothing you can experience, but this is actually beyond nothing. Yeah, oh. Stopping. Ceasing. So okay, so the inference yeah. is after that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is like super duper, duper, duper profound. Yeah, it's like, it's <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it is maybe. I think something, something like it. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's it, it maybe if you want something that is maybe similar, it is kind of a little bit similar, but it's much more profound than that. Uh, yeah, deep sleep. You can. You okay? Sometimes you come out. You're very nicely rested. The next morning you feel really good because you're well rested. Uh, but in deep sleep, there's still things going on. Uh, there's still. If you wake someone up in deep sleep, uh, and you ask them what's happening, there's still some very subtle dreams usually going on, even in the deepest of sleep. Usually, yeah. You can't remember it because they're very subtle. So if you wait till the morning, you can't remember it. But if you wake them up in the middle of the night, they've done experiments on this apparently. Yeah. And apparently you still dream. Yeah, it's not just the REM, rapid eye movement stage that you dream. Apparently you dream all the time. So the mind is still going, but it's kind of very subtle at that particular point. So it's much more profound than that. Yeah. And uh, when you come out of uh, Nirvana Samapati, you are incredibly clear. This is one of the things that you know something very profound has happened. Uh, your mind has become... The this is the s deepest kind of peace you can ha have. Actually, you don't even have the peace because nobody has it, but the deepest kind of peace. And because of that, when you come out, your faculties are super duper sharp. Uh, yeah, everything is sharper than ever before. Your very clear mind, everything is more clear. Even when you come out of a jhana, you are very clear. This is even much more clear than that again. Huh? So this is how you know something has happened. Yeah? You don't know what because you weren't there, but uh, something very profound has happened. The time has really passed really quickly. Seven days gone by like that. Uh, there's a nice story. This is a nice story about the a Chinese master, ma em Empty Cloud. You've heard about uh, Empty Cloud? Uh, Xu Yin, yeah. A very, very famous uh, Chinese monk who lived, he, he was born back in the 1840s, 1860s or something like that. And he was one of the most famous monks in uh, China in the modern era. Uh, one of his disciples was um, a monk who started the city of 10,000 Buddhas in San Francisco later on. And he died, he died a few years ago. That was his disciple. Uh, and he was very famous as a meditation master. And apparently he was, uh, one day he was offered a meal. Yeah. He said, oh, venerable, venerable sir, you know, meal. So he's, he accepted the meal and then he said to himself, oh, I'm just going to do a bit of meditation first before I eat. Uh, yeah, so he went into meditation uh, and he went so deep. Uh, after seven days he came out. Uh, and the meal was all moldy <laughs> and green. I couldn't eat it. I couldn't eat it anymore. Yeah. That's one of those amazing stories. Yeah, and uh, he was the kind of character that you might believe. Maybe he could do such things. Sometimes it, these, these are stories. It's very hard to know how true they are, but uh, it is possible that they are true, huh? and uh, it fits with uh, the you know what can possibly be done in the suttas. So. Yes.
Uh, yes, uh, Ajahn. Uh, uh, many years ago, I went to a retreat and uh, it was focusing on rising, falling of the abdomen. So now when I do, when I do the breathing, I sort of sometimes get a bit confused. Yeah. Well, what's your advice? <laughs> it's okay. You can you can do that. I I kind of like Ajahn Brahm's technique where you just know that the breath is going in and out. You don't really focus on any particular area of the body. Huh? But uh, focusing on the abdomen is is okay. Yeah. I I mean the, the Pali word, the Pali phrase is uh, parimukkang satting upadapetva. Huh? So. And that does n does not mean the abdomen. If it means anything, it means kind of in front of you, yeah, in the kind of in your vicinity, right here and now, parimukkang. Yeah. So it's more likely just to mean in front of you in a general sense. Uh, but uh, it is mindfulness of breathing, and I I think it probably doesn't matter all that much. But just have a general awareness: Are you breathing in? Are you breathing out? Don't connect it to any part on the body. Yeah. This is not body contemplation. Yeah, this is not physical body contemplation is a breath contemplation specifically yeah. so just stay with the breath don't go any don't do anything else uh. people say feel it here feel it there but actually forget about the body altogether yeah. it is possible to know whether you're breathing in or whether you're breathing out without tying it down to any part of the body yeah. so try that yeah but, but there isn't any final right or wrong you know if you feel the breath in the abdomen if you feel it in the nostrils or the upper lip or whatever all of these things are okay especially as long as you're making progress if you stop making progress that is when it is better to kind of to recalibrate a little bit and ask yourself is there something else I should be doing here so yeah is that, is that helpful huh? yeah <laughs> okay very good huh? okay anyone else wanna say anything here Everyone is happy here. Yeah. yeah. Are you happy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and then uh, we can uh, call it a day here. Yeah.